I started by saying that one of the relations between capitalism and democracy is contradiction. You can't have capitalist democracy. And the people who really sort of believe in markets, or at least pretend to understand that, so if you read Milton Friedman and other apostles of so-called libertarianism, they don't call for democracy. They call for what they call freedom, which is a very, in, a very restrictive concept of freedom. It's not the freedom of a, a, a working person to control their work, their lives, and so on. It's their freedom to submit themselves to control by a higher authority. That's called freedom, uh, but not democracy. They don't like democracy, and they're right. Uh, capitalism and democracy really are inconsistent. Uh, actually, what's called libertarianism in the United States is about as extremely extreme an example of anti-libertarianism that you can imagine. They're in favor of private tyranny, the worst kind of tyranny. Tyranny by unaccountable private concentrations of wealth. When they say, uh, well, we don't want government interference in the market, uh, they mean that. They mean, uh, maybe they don't understand it, but if you think it through, it's pretty obvious. The kind of interference in the market they want to block is the kind that would permit unconstrained tyranny on the part of totally unaccountable uh, private tyrannies, which is what corporations are. It's worth bearing in mind how radically opposed this is to classical liberalism. Now, they like to invoke, say, Adam Smith. But if you read Adam Smith, he said the opposite. He, he's famous for not, you know, the, the claim is that he was opposed to regulation, government regulation, uh, interference in markets. It's not true. He was in favor of regulation, as he put it, when it benefits the working man. He was against interference when it benefited the masters. That's traditional classical liberalism. This, what's called libertarian in the United States, which likes to invoke the, the history that they've concocted, is uh, radically opposed to basic classical libertarian principles. And uh, it's kind of astonishing to me that a lot of young people, say college students, are attracted by this kind of thing. I mean, you can, after all, read the classical texts. And so take, say, Adam Smith. I mean, Adam Smith at the time, uh, he's the icon, you know, of liberty. Uh, he's, uh, he was considered to be a dangerous radical at the time because he was pretty anti-capitalist. It's pre, sort of pre-capitalist era, but he was opposed to it. Uh, he condemned what he called the, the vile maxim of the masters of mankind, all for ourselves and nothing for anyone else. Uh, that's an abomination. Uh, the, take the phrase invisible hand, everybody's learned that in high school or college. Uh, Adam Smith actually did use the term, rarely. But take a look at how he used it in Wealth of Nations, his major work. It's used once. And if you look at the context, it's an argument again, against what is now called neoliberal globalization. And what he argued is this. He was concerned with England, of course. He said, suppose in England that the merchants and manufacturers invested abroad and imported from abroad. He said, well, that would be profitable for them about what would be harmful to the people of England. However, they will have enough of a commitment to their own country, to England, what's called a home bias in the literature. They'll have enough of a home bias so that as if by an invisible hand, they'll keep to the less profitable actions and England will be saved from the ravages of what we call neoliberal globalization. That's the one use of the term in Wealth of Nations. In his other major work, Moral Sentiments, terms also used once, and the context is this. It's, remember, England's basically an agricultural <coughs> country then. He says, suppose some landlord uh, uh, accumulates an enormous amount of land and everybody else has to work for him. He says, well, that won't turn out too badly, and the reason is that the landlord will be motivated 
by his natural sympathy for other people. So he will make sure that the necessities of life and the goods available will be distributed uh, equitably to the to his uh, the people on his lands, and it'll end up. Uh, with this, uh, uh, an equal, relatively equal and just uh, distribution of wealth, as if by an invisible hand. Uh, that's his other use of the term. Uh, just compare that with what you're taught in school or what you're reading in the newspapers. And it goes across the board, like everybody probably has read uh, the first paragraphs of Wealth of Nations, which talks about how wonderful it is that the butcher pursues his interests and the baker pursues in his interests, we're all happy. So we should be in favor of a division of labor. Everybody's read that. Uh, how many people have read a couple of hundred pages into Wealth of Nations where he has a bitter attack on division of labor for interesting reasons, and reasons that were standard in the Enlightenment environment in which he lived, very different from ours. Uh, he says, if you, if you pursue division of labor, people will be directed to actions in which they'll just repeat the same mechanical operations over and over. They'll be de-skilled. Okay, that's the goal of management for 100 years, de-skill the workforce. He says, that's what'll happen if you pursue division of labor. He goes on to say, this will turn people into creatures as stupid and ignorant as a human being can possibly be. And therefore, in any civilized society, the government will have to intervene to prevent any development like this. And that's Adam Smith's view of division of labor. The next step, uh, here's a research project. Take the standard edition, scholarly edition of Wealth of Nations, uh, produced by the University of Chicago Press, naturally, on the bicentennial with a scholarly apparatus, you know, footnotes and everything else. And take a look at the index. There's a scholarly index. Look up division of labor. This part of the book is not referenced. You can't find it unless you decide to read 700 pages. Then you can find it. But that's his concept of division of labor. And it continues like this. I mean, I'm not extolling you know, a lot of things that are you can harshly criticize, like his advice to the colonies. But nevertheless, it's a very different picture from what's called libertarianism or capitalism today. Uh, capitalist democracy would self-destruct. Capitalism would self-destruct. And that's why it hasn't been instituted. Uh, the, the masters understand that they cannot survive a capitalist economy, let's say fair economy. And you take a look at the history, it's pretty interesting. Uh, so the United States, when it was, it was independent, so it could reject the rules of sound economics and it developed. And there were other countries that were poised for an industrial revolution and were given the same advice, like Egypt and India. In fact, India already was the commercial industrial center of the world, more so than England. Egypt was poised for an industrial revolution. And it's not impossible that it might have developed. It was a rich agrarian society. It had cotton, produced cotton. As I say, that's the main product, like oil today. And it didn't need slaves. It had peasants. Uh, it had a developmental government uh, aimed at uh, industrial development. It could have taken off, just as India could have taken off. But they were not free to reject sound economics, because they were ruled by British force. So they were forced to accept sound economics. And Egypt became Egypt, and the United States became the United States. Uh, India went through a century of de-development until it finally got independence. Uh, that's what happens when you apply laissez-faire principles. In fact, that's essentially how the third world and the first world divided. You take a look at the countries that developed. They're the countries who violated the principles. England, the United States, Germany, France, uh, uh, the, low, the Netherlands. Uh, uh, one country of the South, one country developed, Japan. The one country that wasn't colonized and was able to 
pursued the same course that the rich countries developed. Uh, I, I mentioned that it, it, in mid 19th century, 1846, Britain was so far ahead of the rest of the world in industrial development that they did ex decide that laissez-faire would be possible. So they moved to what's called the free trade uh, era. It didn't, first of all, they imposed sharp constraints on it. Uh, they uh, cut off the empire, India. India was not allowed to, others could not invest in India, their main possession. And India was not allowed to develop. Uh, and there were other restrictions. But pretty soon, uh, British capitalists called the game off uh, because they couldn't compete. Uh, by the 1920s, they couldn't compete with the Japanese production. So they literally closed off the empire to Japanese exports. That's part of the background for the Pacific War in the 1940s. The United States did the same with its smaller empire, the Philippines. The Dutch did the same with Indonesia. All the imperial systems decided no more free trade, we can't compete. So they closed off the empire, meaning Japan had no markets, no resources, and they went to work. Uh, that's a large part of the background. The United States in 1945 did uh, uh, move towards laissez-faire. In fact, there was an important conference. The United States was basically running the world at that point, you know, for obvious reasons. Uh, there was a hemispheric conference called by Washington, February 1945 in Mexico where the Western Hemisphere was compelled to adopt an economic charter for the Americas, uh, which, which banned any interference with market principles. The goal was, you read the State Department reports, to oppose the new nationalism in Latin America, which is based on the idea that the resource, that, that the people of a country should benefit from the country's resources. That's evil, can't allow that. It's Western and US investors who have to benefit from their resources. So that was the economic charter of the Americas imposed on the countries of the hemisphere with one exception here. The United States did not follow those policies. Quite the contrary, as I mentioned, there was a massive development of a state based economy with an industrial policy, uh, the kind that created the modern high-tech economy. Uh, you can see it right across the river. Take, take a look at MIT, right? One of the main centers of this. If you looked at MIT in the 1950s when I got there, it was surrounded by uh, electronics-based high-tech firms like Raytheon and iTech, you know, huge uh, IT firms. Uh, you take a look at MIT today, take a look at the buildings. It's Novartis, uh, Pfizer, and so on. The reason is completely obvious. During the 50s and the 60s, the cutting edge of the economy was electronics-based. So the, the way to get the public to pay for it was to scream Russians and to get them to pay higher taxes for the Pentagon, and then the Pentagon would fund uh, the research and development, like my own salary, for example. I shouldn't complain too much. And, uh, the, uh, uh, and of course, a private, so-called private industry was around there like vultures to pick up the, uh, the products and the research and just market it. Well, since the 70s, the cutting edge of the economy has been moving towards being biology-based. So funding, government funding has shifted. Pentagon funding is declining. Funding from the NIH and other so-called health-related government institutions is increasing. And the private corporations understand that. So now uh, Novartis, uh, you know, gen genetic engineering firms and so on are hanging around uh, trying to pick up the research that you're paying for uh, so that they can market it and make profits. It's just transparent, it's in front of our eyes. And it takes a very effective uh, educational system to prevent people from seeing it. Uh, it's, 
virtually transparent. That's the way really existing capitalist democracy works. Let's say a final word about democracy, and then I'm afraid I have to leave. Uh, there's a major attack on democracy all the way through. But by now it's reached the point uh, which is pretty remarkable. I mean, you take a look at main, one of the main topics in mainstream political science, you know, I'm not talking about radicals, mainstream political science is comparing public attitudes with public policy. It's a fairly straightforward, you know, it's hard work, but straightforward effort. We have the public policy, so you can see it. There's extensive polling, quite reliable generally, consistent in its results. It gives you a good sense of what public attitudes are. And the results of this are published in the major books and articles, I'll give you references if you like. The results are very straightforward. About 70% of the population, the lowest 70% on the income scale, are literally disenfranchised. Their opinions have no effect on policy. Their elected representatives don't pay any attention to them. Uh, that's one of the reasons why many of them don't bother voting. Uh, they're not going to pay attention to them anyway. They may not read the technical literature, but you understand it in other ways. Uh, as you move up the income scale, you begin to get a little more, uh, a little more influence on policy. When you get to the top, and uh, contrary to the Occupy movement, it's not 1%, it's more like one-tenth of 1%. When you get to the top, where the massive concentration of wealth is, they basically set policy. That's, that's not democracy, that's plutocracy. And that's what we have accepted. And the good thing about it is it's changeable. It's not controlled by force. We are very free in that respect thanks to victories over the centuries. Uh, the, it's not possible now for a corporation to do what Andrew Carnegie, the great pacifist, did in uh, 1890. Uh, that gives a lot of options, and you have to make use of them. I'm afraid I gotta leave. Thank you.